I have to start with the confession. Um, Blake did such a great confession um, to start us off with music tonight, but I have another confession, and that is this, I am a horrible person. And here's how you can tell. My dear mother, God bless her, once got us a subscription to People magazine, and I read it cover to cover every Saturday over my breakfast of soft-cooked eggs. That means that I am fully aware of the lurching, let's call them paparoxisms, focusing on poor Prince Harry and Meghan. If People magazine weren't bad enough, I have also been gripped by the sordid media conglomerate machinations of the characters on HBO's Succession. Yeah, they're, they're worse than the British royal family. And most telling of all, on the Reddit social media platform, I revel in reading the, I, I gotta say this, am I the asshole subreddit. I also have a modicum of piety, tact, and good taste, so I think I can get through the rest of this without using that word that I learned early on at the feet of my alcoholic little church great uncles. Let's make it easier on ourselves, though, and instead of doing linguistic acro acrobatics, let's just substitute the word avocado for the other A word. The descriptor for A-I-T-A, am I the avocado, on Reddit's thread says this, a catharsis for the frustrated moral philosopher in all of us and a place to finally find out if you are wrong in an argument that's been bothering you. Tell us about any nonviolent conflict you've experienced. Give us both sides of the story and find out if you're right or you're the avocado. People submit stories of family drama at weddings and funerals, conflicts with vegan children, and squabbles about making the world safe for high anthropology while being utterly astounded at how low their fellow human beings can actually sink into the mire of a-holery. A-I-T-A for making my son eat off dirty dishes. A-I-T-A for telling my sister I am never babysitting for her again. A-I-T-A for being, still being mad my brother stole my daughter's name for his own child. I have a sinner inside me who loves the feeling of schadenfreude these threads raise in me. I get to pat myself on the back for not being an awful friend or cruel step-sibling. I get to feel good about not having paid people costumed as Mickey and Minnie Mouse to be props at my wedding reception rather than choosing to feed my guests or being angry that the kids blew up condoms and taped them to my glorious Ford F-150 at our reception and ruined the truck's bright red finish. This year marks 500 years since an I am the avocado eligible occurrence went down in Martin Luther's city of Wittenberg. Since back in 1517, when we celebrated the 500th anniversary of Luther's 95 Theses, and the first of these Here We Still Stand events happened, we have had a number of similar anniversaries that have come down the pike, including the Heidelberg Disputation in 2019 and Luther's appearance before the Diet of Worms last year. This year is the 500th anniversary of Luther abandoning the safety of his kingdom of the birds at the Wartburg Castle and his return to his home base of Wittenberg that was reeling in his absence. While the reforming cat was away, the true believing avocado green tinged mice played. Luther's fellow university professor, Andreas Bodenstein von Karlstadt, was one of the culprits. Karlstadt was in full agreement with Luther's teaching on justification. And he supported Luther's efforts to counter what he thought were Rome's abuses. Karlstadt just didn't think that things were being fixed quickly enough. 
he and others took it upon themselves to take advantage of the full liberty that they'd been given in Christ. And heeding Paul's dictum in Galatians 5 that Dan Price pointed to, they refused to submit again to a yoke of slavery. Karlstadt led worship, get this, without donning the proper pastoral vestments. Academic robes work just fine for a free faculty member of the university. And the worship service was held not in sacred and flowing Latin, ecce homo, but in the low and guttural German, ach, du lieber Gott. What an avocado. <laughs> At the same time, statues and houses of worship were removed to avoid worshiping graven images and breaking the first commandment, subclause A, as the legal brief would put it. Wittenberg had been left in the solid theological hands of Luther's friend and university colleague Philip Melanchthon, who the previous year had produced the best systematic rendering of evangelical teaching yet, but he was not administrator enough, politician enough, or cojones bearer enough to wangle a solution to the iconoclasm. Eventually, the controversy drew Luther home from the protection of the Wartburg Castle. At an inn on the way home from Eisenach, a couple students who themselves were heading to Wittenberg encountered Luther, but because he'd grown a Scott Keith beard and pandemic hair a la Dan Van Voris, they didn't recognize him. Whether he cleaned himself up for it or not, the whole iconoclastic mess of Schwermerei found its conclusion with a set of eight sermons that Luther preached at the city church starting on Invocavit Sunday. The sermons are Luther's way of saying A-I-T-A, you all are, everyone sucks here. <laughs> the Invocavit sermons are worth reading, especially because Luther decided to be more brief than usual. In the first of the sermons, Luther didn't call anyone out as an avocado by name, but he did advocate a goat. Thank you. I'll be here all weekend. He did advocate a ghost slow approach to instituting change in the church. You become the Christian A in AITA when you do not consider the ramifications of your actions on those who are not as advanced in the faith as you think you are. 35 years ago, when I was on a camp staff, I had the privilege of going spelunking in Jewel Cave National Monument in the Black Hills of South Dakota, the third longest cave in the world. That afternoon of cave crawling was one of the best nature experiences I've ever had. There were a half dozen of us, along with our park ranger, outfitted with gloves and helmets and lamps. At the orientation on the visitor center patio, along with having to get through a cinder block that had a hole in it this tall and this wide and this deep, we learned another important rule, along with the stricture that you have to pack everything out of the cave that you pack in, including waste of every stripe, Okay, This other important rule was this, though. People who cave crawl follow the dictum that it is life-threatening to assume that you are responsible for keeping up with the person in front of you. Instead, you are in charge of the person behind you. In other words, the slowest person in the group sets the pace. That way, no one gets lost and abandoned in the cave. The iconoclasts and enthusiasts in Wittenberg decided that they knew best how reform should happen. They set the pace in the, electrical city, in the electoral city and assumed others would have to keep up with them. But Luther, in the Invocavit sermons, argued that they had left behind those who weren't quite there with them yet and had endangered their faith. The best-intentioned reforms, even though well-meant, did damage. 
And since justification comes through faith alone, the reforming actions of the iconoclasts threatened others' salvation. Luther's take was that even the best decisions need to have the weakest among us at the forefront of our thinking. The work of reform should always follow spelunking rules. We ought always consider the laggards and slowpokes, the thick-headed and reluctant, Luther argued that Karlstadt and the leaders of his pack of pace setters were attempting to feed a nice Iowa corn-fed ribeye steak to newborns who hadn't even made it to Gerber-strained peas yet. Even if a change is due, it gets tabled to make sure there's time for God to bring folks on board. A dozen years later, in Münster a city near the border with the Netherlands, a Dutch baker named Jan Matisse and other virulently anti-Roman partisans led a rebellion of Anabaptists against the city's leaders. They attempted to establish the kingdom of God here on earth. They ousted the mayor and the city council and installed fellow Anabaptists in positions of authority. You should start hearing echoes of our culture today. The bishop, Franz von Waldeck, was expelled to a corner of Westphalia, and with the bishop ensconced in his figurative Volkswagen camper van, earnest Anabaptist reforms reforms began to be dictated to the people of Münster. It didn't take much time for other besieged Anabaptists of the Low Countries to get word that Münster had become a haven for folks who agreed with the Wittenberg reformers about what they considered to be the faithless and craven policies and practices of the church in Rome. They flocked to Münster because the newly selected leaders made it not just a haven of the godly, but the exact location where God was going to visibly break in to rule and to bring about the new apocalyptic age they had expected and naturally knew themselves to be worthy of. That Münster's population was by and large regarded as famously wealthy didn't hurt matters any, which was a draw for poor people in the low countries. But the Münster Anabaptists were also certain that Luther had not gone far enough. To them, Luther had been fairly lily-livered, and he certainly had the whole baptism thing wrong. (laughs) Duh! The Munster rebels established a sectarian government that wasn't just neutral toward the faith, but actively pushed societal structures and laws to ensure the protection of radical Reformation tenets. The council decreed that all adults had to be rebaptized because the sacrament administered to them as infants and children was invalid and required an assent of the will that only an adult believer could give. So on January 5th, 1534, more than a thousand adults were rebaptized in Münster. And the story gets worse. The property of those who disagreed with the Anabaptists and left Münster to protect their own lives and limbs was confiscated and distributed to the poor, after which followed a decree that now all property was to be held in common. They made like the Stasi, the East German secret police who once sought to arrest my grandfather after the fall of the Berlin Wall. They started shredding everything, deeds, contracts, loan documents, anything that indicated private ownership in Münster. Let there be no Ananias and Sapphira holding onto their beloved stuff in our city. Like the community of believers in Acts, you are going to share for Jesus' sake. Or else. Although, spoiler alert, later in the story, people in Münster would be struck dead by non-divine hands. When the former bishop returned to besiege the city, Jan Matisse, who regarded himself as a 16th century Gideon out to judge the faithless, thought that merely leading a small procession against the bishop's forces would do the trick of defending Münster handily. They had God on their side, after all. But Matisse was captured and beheaded. His head 
was placed on a pike and his junk, shall we say, was nailed to the city gate as a warning to present and future rebels. A new leader was called for. In the place of Matisse, John of Leiden proclaimed himself the, new, the king of the New Jerusalem. And because of the influx of Anabaptist immigrants, Munster faced a vexing problem. There were now twice as many women as men in the city. And something had to be done to provide for poor females who had arrived with millennial expectations, but no male relative to care for them. Leiden now decreed that polygamy was compulsory. He himself took 16 wives. One report says that a woman, Elisabeth von Scherer, who'd caught his eye, was beheaded in the city square for refusing to marry him. By the time the bishop's siege had gone on for a year, food stores had diminished and people in Munster were starving for the sake of God. On June 24, 1535, about the time that Luther was lecturing on Galatians, the siege succeeded. Munster was retaken, and John of Leiden, the so-called king of the New Jerusalem, was arrested along with the Anabaptist mayor, Bernhard Knipperdoling, and another leader, Bernhard Krechting. The three Anabaptists sat in a dungeon in the neighboring city for months until midwinter when they were trotted out to the Munster Marktplatz for public humiliation, torture, and execution. Over the course of an hour, they were tied to poles with spiked collars, had their flesh ripped away with red-hot tongs. Finally, their tongues were torn out, and they were killed with a heated dagger to the heart. But that was not enough vengeance inflicted. The three dead bodies were then hoisted in seven-foot-tall cages to hang from the 300-foot spire of the recently completed St. Lamberti Kirche, on the town square to rot away for the next 50 years and be pecked apart by scavenging birds. The message was clear. Don't follow these guys' take on Christian nationalism. Instead, allow us to coerce you to our version. The three cages, Anabaptist cages, hang above the Münster marketplace to this day. Given the empty pews in German churches these days, I'm not sure they've had the desired effect of inducing religious fervor. If only John of Leiden had posted a subreddit query about the events in Münster, I'm sure that Reddit readers' response would be that everyone sucks here. Both the Anabaptist zealots and those who took back Münster. A-I-T-A-A, -A -A. am I the Anabaptist avocado here? Yes, indeed but it's also possible to be told that you are the evangelical avocado. In the Augsburg Confession of 1530, our old friend Philip Melanchthon gives us a subtle hint about instituting reform in the church and avoiding acting like an avocado, whether of the Anabaptist or the evangelical variety. After four articles that trace Luther's foundational teaching about God, sin, the work of Christ, and justification by faith, Melanchthon, Melanchthon gives us Article 5, the office of preaching. In it, he declares that in order to create saving faith, God gives the word proclaimed in law and gospel and in the sacraments. There is no remedy for sin, he says, for the condition of sin that he raised earlier. All that is needed is what Luther's hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God, calls one little word that has the power to subdue the eternal foes of faith. In Luther's 1522 Invocavi sermons, he told the Wittenbergers sitting in the pews in the city church that the word can do its work without us dictating the terms of its job description. Thank you very much. All that's needed for this saving work to happen is one willing preacher at one end, a gap filled by the Holy Spirit with the word, and finally the kingdom of God at the other. Luther said, while Philip and Amsdorf and I sat around drinking Wittenberg beer, the word did everything. The word didn't need no stinking Wittenberg iconoclast preaching in the vernacular with their feet in sneakers, with their shirt tails untucked, 
for contemporary relevance. <laughs> Better? In Munster, a decade later, the word didn't need a hand from any highly religious and terribly admirable folks who established a sectarian government that determined exactly what the kingdom of God would look like in their city. The word didn't need people whose cocksure belief blinded them and led them to trample on weaker believers or less sophisticated theological rubes, much less unbelievers still shackled by sin. For this, Christ died? Probably not. What Luther didn't include in his sermon was how the word's work happens in practice. It doesn't happen from within a moral system, from worldly wisdom, and certainly not from a stance of power and control. The story of Bill W., one of the founders of Alcoholics Anonymous, can be instructive for us. When he and Dr. Bill got sober in Akron, Ohio in 1935, it was just two drunks leaning on each other admitting they were powerless over their obsession with potent potables, as Alex Trebek would call it. Call it the mutual conversation and consolation of the blitzed and besotted. Bill W. expected that his experience of enlightenment and inspirational success would lead others to achieve sobriety, but what he discovered was that telling his glorious story of victory didn't ever help anybody want to get clean or stay sober. Actual gutter drunks facing their weakness could not imagine being able to achieve such a thing. It was only when Bill W. found drunks on bar stools in saloons and told them his own sordid history, how far he'd fallen, how he'd bottomed out, that anyone could ever actually imagine not regularly seeing themselves looking back in the bottom of a glass. Then they could see themselves not as people who would quit drinking permanently, but as busted up people who just don't start drinking again today. They could begin to savor that other fermented delight, daily bread rather than daily dread. My obsession the status, power, and control of Ken Jones is the primary reason why I get indignant if a worship service doesn't begin with confession and forgiveness. I walk into the nave of the church with a bound will that wants to settle into a pew with a padded cushion and lay my petty, tinkerable peccadillos before God, decide to reform myself, and later walk out with a newly strengthened spine and perhaps a few tips for building a more successful suburban spirituality gleaned from a winsome pastor's sermon. But what I really need is the truth that my sin runs deeper than a few minor tweakable quirks. I need to be the sinful equivalent of one of Bill W.'s falling off a bar stool drunks who can at last be honest about how messed up an avocado I am. So I need to confess. Not only that, I need more than just speaking a line about how I haven't measured up. I've had it. I've had it with confessions that don't confess anything big enough to need the cross to repair. I need to declare my bondage. I have to get real about my obsession with myself and my addictions to all things that will secure the Ken Jones I so carefully curate and present to others. In other words, Ken Jones, the fallow, used-up ground for the word that will be preached must be broken open and laid bare. The sordid truth must be made known. A couple decades ago, in, Luther, in a Luther Seminary Chapel sermon, I think it was, Steve Paulson made a surprising statement. He said that there are places where the gospel is more true than in others, which you'd go, it's true everywhere. But no, he said, what I think he meant was that the gospel is not the gospel when it's proclaimed to those whose comfort and security provide them insulation from the vicissitudes of life. The gospel isn't the gospel for those who have no ears to hear. 
So when Luther said in the Invocavit sermons that the word did everything, it was a specific word with a specific set of auditors. It was only the word that was preached to people living under the burden of their crosses. This is what it means to be a theologian of the cross. The word does no good planted in glory. Like Jesus, the embodied word himself, the gospel comes to and is heard by Robert Capon's litany of L words. The least, the last, the lost, the lame, the leper, the lachrymose. He never used the word lachrymose. The la broken, the la captive, and the la godless. This is why the easiest place I have ever preached or taught is St. Dismas Lutheran Church in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Do you know who St. Dismas was? He was the thief on the cross next to Jesus. St. Dismas Lutheran Church is a congregation behind the walls of the South Dakota State Penitentiary. Its members are to a person convicted of crimes, guilty of misdemeanors and felonies, murderers, assaulters, pedophiles, and purveyors of highly desired mood-enhancing substances. No preacher needs to convince people of their sin when they are known by a number rather than a name, and their future is determined by the worst day in their past. To stand at the lectern in a Thursday, night eve Thursday evening worship service at St. Dismas is to encounter a bunch of men in tan scrubs who are ravenous for a word that can raise them from the death they live every boring day with every tasteless meal, with every demand from a corrections officer and at the sound of every clanging sally port door. To preach to these men who don't have the luxury of pretending they're okay like I do is to stand at the mouth of Lazarus's tomb and deliver the only word that can possibly knit bone to bone in Ezekiel's valley. When the word enters the grave, then at long last sigh of relief, its public proclaimers can then kick back with the Wittenberg beer and trust that the gospel will do its work without their wisdom, understanding, or effort. But if the word is delivered to the self-sufficient, well-composed, and highly effective, then it will require constant monitoring or worse, coercion. The bound will cannot choose to change. The law will have to stand over it, less like the pedagogue of Galatians and Moors and Egyptian taskmaster threatening enslaved Israelites in Exodus. Even something as well intended as John Calvin's establishment of a Christian city council in 16th century Geneva misses the mark. Certainly, it's why the Christian nationalism that has been so hotly debated of late is hardly Christian at all, because it has no need of Jesus save as a good example. The cross is superfluous. It's all based on the law, uses only the law, requires the constant monitoring of the law to maintain its sovereignty. As Luther said in the Heidelberg Disputation, the law says, do this, and it is never done. More law will have to be enacted. Nits will have to be picked. More strictures will need to be laid down. More demands will be placed on already broken sinners. And when it's done in the name of God, the result is what was felt by an obscure Augustinian friar named Martin Luther, who came to despair of ever finding a way out. He was done, done, with the God who placed such burdens on him. Insult to injury, salt in wounds, enough of that. If that's the God you have to offer, better worship at the Wittenberg Starbucks at the, end of Kalag at the other end of Kalagienstrasse down by the Bordello. At least the people in both those places are honest about what they're selling. As Luther argued, better to deal with full-on Pelagian heretics than the semi-Pelagian self-helpers hoping for a little human agency, decency, and initiative, and demanding what we, that we do what is within us to do. Facite, quod in te est. This year, 
marks the 50th anniversary of the publication of my beloved teacher, Gerhard Ferdy's book, Where God Meets Man. Many of you know and love that book, don't you? I picked it up again last week and found this gem among the few rare sections that I haven't highlighted over the years. This is what he wrote. Luther was striving for the whole person, for a completely restored person, for an entirely free person. He said man, but it's the 21st century. We have bargained only for little bits, Ferdy said, a little bit of freedom, a little bit of integrity, a little bit of leftover goodness, created goodness. And we get in such matters just what we bargained for, a Christianity of little bits, a little bit of freedom, but mostly bondage to legalistic codes, a little bit of devotion, but mostly a despising of life and human achievement, a little bit in the collection played on Sunday, but mostly nothing for larger concerns of human justice and social improvement. Our Christianity, Ferdy said, is an indication of our theology. We insist on a little bit of freedom and, and integrity that is all we ever get, and it shows. Ferdy's still on target 50 years later. We're left with what often happens when I buy avocados at High V. I stand before a pile of these dark green unripe things at the supermarket thinking of what a wondrous future what wondrous future creations my hands will make. Homemade guacamole. Bacon, lettuce, tomato and avocado sandwiches on homemade artisanal bread made with my own hands. I test five or six avocados and I find them all hard, but I figure that in three days time, that's biblical, they'll, will, they'll do. All it will take is a bit of Mad-Eye Moody's constant vigilance, but my desired vigilance is never enough. My observational acuity always comes up lacking. I am ever the guaca failure. I slice my avocados open and discover very little luscious green, but find instead the fruit are brown and riddled with rot. Instead of being the enjoyer of the gift of green, I am perpetually the champion avocado slayer of North Walnut Creek Drive, left with only a tiny morsel, a tiny morsel of fatty green goodness. To repeat Ferdy, we have bargained only for little bits, a little bit of freedom, a little bit of integrity, a little bit of leftover created goodness. Sinners starving for grace and mercy then are given a little brown mush and go away with empty bellies. The church in our day and its so-called leaders by and large deliver moral thera therapeutic deism disconnected from God's actual work of death and resurrection. Jesus, the only word whose work is powerful enough to allow for the relaxed drinking of Wittenberg beer is a mere dealer add-on to the main vehicle of our plans and schemes in spite of our sorry history and sordid outcomes. Years after the Invocavi sermons in 1530, it was only after Philip Melanchthon asserted in the Augsburg Confession that the word of God brings saving faith through preaching and the sacraments that he finally spoke of reforms. After Article 5 on the Office of Preaching came Article 6 on the New Obedience. Only, only when the gospel is delivered in its truth and purity can any honest and real change happen. The gospel is more true when one person drunk on themselves gets it declared to them by another person drunk on themselves but who's been saved from their self-obsession by being pulled into the embrace of God's word. In the small catechism, Luther answered the question, what does baptism mean for daily living? He said it means that our old sinful self with all its evil deeds and desires should be drowned through daily repentance and a new self arise to live with God in righteousness and purity forever. It sounds a heck of a lot like a 12-step program with the added benefit of some actual specific good news attached to it. It's interesting that Melanchthon never provided any details about what that new obedience actually looks like. That's because the Holy Spirit is so blamed unpredictable. 
The Spirit blows willy-nilly and not only produces faith when and where it wills, but also produces results in ways we can't imagine in advance and often among people my mom would prefer I not associate with. Why did she get me People magazine then? It is a manifestation of my sin to seek reform apart from the word of the cross and to bray and crow with wisdom about what my self-sanctified imagination leads me to envision as the kingdom. When Jesus read from the Isaiah scroll in Nazareth in Luke 4, he told us the gospel would appear at the verge of the grave. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Each of the recipients of the Lord's favor is as good as dead. It's echoed in Revelation 21. See, how did Dan put it? Look, (laughs) right? The home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his peoples and God himself will be with them and there be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. The kingdom looks like a freshly filled grave and the church looks like people in mourning attire having a laugh at the ridiculousness of their veils and black armbands. There are countless and varied routes to the city of God, but every single one leads through the cross and grave. If it doesn't cross those city limits, you are not using a gospel GPS system. If I truly want to change the world, I can't use the law to coerce anyone into my religious or political camp. The faithful response to sin and brokenness around me is not more law. That is the move of theologians of glory. Moses, God love him, has never been our savior. The task instead is that of a theologian of the cross, the bestowal of the gospel that brings the barely imaginable future of the lion lying down with the lamb, toddlers playing safely near the adder's den, and me and my neighbor both being raised from the dead. It's not my business to demand that you contort yourself to my favored political brand, my love of John Stuart Mill's utilitarianism, or my immaculate taste in cheesy 1970s top 41 hit wonders, much less to say your faith has to play out in a specific way. You are free to be an undercover angel to bring people to their heaven on the seventh floor. As C.S. Lewis said in The Problem of Pain, You will certainly carry out God's purpose however you act, but it makes a difference to you whether you serve like Judas or like John. God's kingdom will come in and reforms will happen one way or another. Or to put it another way, the spirit will do its work whether you're the avocado or not. All I can do is give it to you straight. You are dead in sin and Jesus Christ is is determined to raise you from the dead and swaddle you in his love and mercy. And with that said, it is time for me to kick back with my own Philip and Amsdorf, Jeff and Tim maybe, and have a beer or a decaf latte whole milk with sugar-free vanilla (laughs) and watch what happens in the hearts of all you avocados. You will be out there in the world doing the opposite of what happens on my kitchen counter. You will be turning from brown mush, ripening and sweetening and becoming as green as the pyramids in ordinary time. You will be voting in a couple weeks, maybe for a party that's not mine. You will be tweaking the technology you somehow managed to cobble together in the height of the pandemic worship tsunami. You will be gathering with a family for Thanksgiving spread, baking Christmas delights. You will be feeling smug that you don't live up north in January, feeling grumpy that you don't live in El Paso in, G- in January. You will celebrate love on Singles Awareness Day on February 14th. 
you will go through the whole year with Stevie Wonder, so I just called to say I love you, and Neil Sedakis, calendar girl, all the while, unbeknownst to you, God's Spirit will keep using the Word to work on you and make you not into avocados, but fruit born by the tree of life. Let's get back together in this place a year from now and use our hindsight to see if what I have given you tonight, what God gives you in your baptism, what he provides in the Lord's Supper, and what is proclaimed to you again and again and again is a word. No, the word that reforms you, repents you, and resurrects you. So here's to a coming year of new life and the fact that the Reformation catchphrase remains true. Verbum Dei Manet in Aeternum. The word of God abides forever. Amen. Thank you.